Okay, um, welcome to this second of two webinars this afternoon on challenge funds, um, organized jointly by IPE Triple Line, CEDA, and the DCED. Um, for those who did not join the first webinar, my name is Medina Henry Fernandez, and I work for the DCD Secretariat. Um, I will just say a few introductory words, um, also why we hopefully will have more people joining just now. Um, and please bear with me, of course, if you've joined the previous webinar and have heard these announcements already. Um, so just briefly, for those of you who don't know much about the DCED, um, the DCED is essentially a forum used by all major donor and development agencies who work with the private sector to exchange uh, practical experience and lessons learned. Um, and as, as I was saying before, uh, the DCD has a working group on private sector engagement, which is very keen to advance peer learning on, on very practical issues that most donor staff and practitioners face in their work. Um, and while challenge funds are still a very popular engagement modality, um, one question that is subject to much deep debate is how to actually manage challenge funds effectively. Um, so for this webinar, we have again teamed up with um, IPE Triple Line, who have recently completed their very extensive evaluation of CEDA's 10 Global Challenge Funds, and so they will uh, share uh, their wisdoms on this topic with us today. Um, before we start, again, just a few practical points. Um, we will go for about an hour, and Martin Wright of IPE Triple Line will kick off uh, with a presentation of about 20 minutes. He will then be joined by his colleagues Matthew Kentridge and David Smith again to answer any of your questions during the discussion. Um, and you might also hear from Jim Tenburn uh, as a moderator who is the DCD coordinator. So again, you know who might be speaking on this call. Um, if you do have any comments or questions in addition to the ones already submitted in advance, um, please do use the chat box um, at the bottom right of the screen and just uh, select send to everyone. This is very important uh, so that the presenters can actually see your question and not just the DCED. Um, please do keep your microphone muted and always keep your camera switched off. That would be helpful. Um, after the webinar, we would, of course, welcome your feedback and we will share a link uh, to really what is a very short survey or feedback form in the chat box. So, uh, yeah, any feed feedback is uh, much appreciated. Uh, just a final point, uh, FIDA also asked us to let you know that any follow-up questions on their challenge funds can be sent to them via email. So, we'll share, again, a dedicated email address with you at the end. That is it on the practical side now. Uh, so let me hand over to Martin Wright of IPE Triple Line, who will now uh, summarize for us really some of the key lessons on how uh, challenge funds can be managed effectively. Uh, Martin, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're joining from. And welcome to this uh, second of the webinars prepared to follow up on the publication of the evaluation of CEDA's Global Challenge Funds. Um, as Melina said, the first webinar used learning from the evaluation to address the question of when to use the Challenge Fund mechanism and some of the associated issues of design. This second webinar is focused on some of the key findings related to the management of Challenge Funds and looks particularly at the issue of the intensity of fund management. The next slide uh, shows the challenge fund intervention model used for the evaluation. So those of you who joined the first webinar will have seen this, and my colleague Matthew covered the uh, um, process on the left-hand side of the uh, diagram uh, up to the decision on the mechanism and design of the fund. And we're now going to focus on the right-hand side. And for the analysis of fund management across the 10 funds, we focused on six stages of fund management, as indicated in the diagram. So it's the design of the, of the fund and the challenges specifically, uh, the preparation and running of calls for proposals, the selection process, the funding agreement or contracting process, um, grant 
management for ongoing uh, grants and, and projects, and finally monitoring, evaluation, and learning. So for each fund, we assess the approach to management at each stage using a, a scorecard approach where we had four or five judgment criteria for each stage and RAG ratings applied to key characteristics. Um, if you want to look in more detail at the methodology, I think it's in F of the full report. As there were significant differences in the context and objectives of each fund, uh, we looked at the reported progress towards achievement of the stated target outcomes and impact, and how the different effort, uh, fund management approaches at each stage influence the progress towards achievements at outcome and impact levels. But we also considered and took into account the contextual and overall design factors also affecting performance and the stage in the life cycle of each fund. Um, because um, some funds are relatively new, only been running for one or two years, others are more mature. So we wanted to have an approach that enabled us to compare across the 10 funds. Um, the next slide gives an overview of our assessment of the progress of each fund towards achievement of targeted outcomes and development impact. Um, it's important to note here that the evaluation is not and was not intended to be a portfolio of 10 separate impact evaluations, but rather an opportunity to learn from the experience and identify trends or characteristics to inform learning about, in this case, the management of funds. Um, on this diagram, the blue discs represent enterprise challenge funds and the orange civil society challenge funds. So, the characteristics of those funds to the, to the right-hand side of the uh, diagram, uh, the char they're characterized by being, being on track to achieve clearly defined outcomes, having clear pathways to development impact, and we were looking for those tracking progress towards systemic impacts. So those considered to be performing particularly well uh, are the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund, uh, powering agriculture, securing water for food, um, and uh, uh, innovations against poverty too. Now in the middle there you've got um, Amplify Change and Global Innovation Fund. Um, these are also considered to be on track, but the investments are still at relatively early stages. So um, a little bit early to tell uh, in terms of, of progress, but things seem to be going pretty well. So those to the left are either off track to achieve their specified outcomes, or they may be on track to, to achieve those, but are considered to be on long pathways to impact without a clear roadmap of how systemic and development impact will be achieved. The next slide um, provides a summary of six key success, success factors for challenge funds emerging from the evaluation. Uh, these are particularly focused on uh, management from the donor perspective, and in a moment we'll look more at the fund manager's perspective. So we have here, and some of these you'll, you'll note will uh, maybe reiterating some of the points raised in the earlier webinar. But the need for a clear understanding of context is very important. This includes space for civil society to operate, uh, number of and capacity of businesses working in the sector for enterprise funds, as well as a basic understanding of the prevailing economic and social conditions within which the fund will operate. Um, in terms of innovation, it's important to have a clear definition of innovation and which stages of innovation are to be supported, while also having a clear theory of change, including pathways to scale, indicating viable plans of how funds supporting innovations will lead to broader development impacts and impact at scale. Um, 
It's also important to establish an honest definition of risk appetite for the program, recognizing you know, the potential for innovations to fail and clear mechanisms to provide opportunities for learning and ad adaptation while also managing risks affecting performance. Um, it's important for donors to maintain oversight and engagement with fund managers to ensure that funds remain focused and on track, but with flexibility to learn from experiences and, uh, and adapt approaches as the fund progresses. Um, engagement with other relevant in-country stakeholders can also be a key success factor, particularly where they have the potential to enhance longer-term performance and impact. Two slides identify in more detail some of the key lessons in terms of good practices for the fund manager level um, and related to each stage in the process. Um, this first slide looks at the first three stages, that's design, launch and selection. Um, the bold text on, on the slide uh, identifies practices that tend to require more intensive fund manager inputs. So for design, we have well-defined outcomes and impact, including a clear definition of envisaged systemic changes. Understanding of context will inform who to target and who to engage. Um, for example, being aware of an existing innovation ecosystem and clear pathways to impact, um, including the specific role of the challenge fund mechanism in the delivery of the broad objectives. Um, another key thing is to be clear whether the Challenge Fund will be a standalone program or a component of a broader development intervention. Um, and again, understanding the specific role of the Challenge Fund in that process. So at the launch stage, um, one of the main obje objectives is to attract an appropriate number of quality applications from the right kind of organizations. Now, the definition of appropriate will vary depending on the objectives. So programs such as the Global Innovation Fund open go, uh, aiming to identify the highly transformative innova innovations may cast a very broad net, um, while those aiming to address specific challenges may be designed to attract very specific types of organization and projects. Um, and following on from that, there's a need for strategic marketing to uh, make sure that appropriate organizations uh, know about the, the, the calls and uh, able to, are able to apply. In terms of selection, the, particularly on the high sort of intensity practices, support and engagement with applicants uh, is important, particularly uh, to improve the quality of proposals or assist with requirements that may be tricky for applicant organizations, such as, you know, for some businesses, uh, considering how to consider development impact may be uh, something they need additional assistance with. And some funds, uh, such as AECF, had engaged quite intensively um, in supporting the development of, of strong proposals. Um, at this point, it's important to know that although not listed explicitly, the evaluation identified the importance of mainstreaming cross-cutting issues such as gender inclusion and inclusion and the environment across all of these stages. Um, so it's very much a, a mainstreaming approach rather than dealing with it separately. Um, last point on selection is the, the, the feedback to applicants, um, which, which can be time consuming but uh, considered, you know, particularly for open programs or where there are multiple rounds, it provides the opportunity for those maybe uh, not used to uh, applying for this sort of funds to, to um, amend their applications and, and reapply and stand a better chance of being funded. The next slide uh, looks at the, the last three uh, stages. Um, and um, at the contracting stage, probably in terms of intensity, it's 
often the development of results frameworks um, and refining plans and budgets and complying with um, donor or fund uh, requ requirements uh, which may need uh, intensive support. Um, in management, and I think it's important to note here that all of the, the management uh, tasks here are in bold because they all tend to be uh, very intense, require intense engagement. Um, and it includes you know, developing an open and productive relationship with the, the partners. Um, and this is important to in, encourage sharing of risks and failures as well as successes and partnering to towards successful achievement. Um, there can then often a need for capacity building to enable organizations to comply with program requirements um, and sometimes for smaller, less experienced companies with interesting innovations, there may be a requirement for business acceleration support. In terms of technical assistance, um, this also varies from program to program. Um, uh, for the AECF agribusiness window, uh, it, it follows the principle that only technologically competent businesses uh, should be supported and therefore should not need assistance in their area of expertise and that also they should be well-established and sustainable businesses. Whereas in other funds, such as powering agriculture, supporting earlier stage innovations, uh, there was more of a requirement for, for technical assistance. Um, performance and risk management is quite often driven by donor requirements for accountability and shared risk um, and can become the most intensive, resource intensive component. Um, but can be more efficient if targeted according to level of risk associated with particular funds. And lastly, on um, monitoring and evaluation and learning, um, tracking of progress towards outcomes and pathways to impact is very important. Acknowledging capacity constraints of the investees in, in measuring development impact and providing support in that area and also establishing communities of practice um, to support sharing of learning and collaboration across the funds. So it's clear that a lot of recommended fund management tasks require fairly intensive uh, management. And if we just look at the next slide, um, this characterizes the intensity of fund management as ranging from light touch to intensive. And you see the Characteristics of the light touch being broadly focused outcomes, light touch screening, award grants, little further engagement, and then report on funds spent and activities undertaken. And then at the other end uh, of the uh, other extreme, there's the intensive fund management characterized by predefined program outcomes, intensive screening with extensive capacity building support, close in country accompaniment or TA for performance management. Uh, intensive and direct measurement of results and broad sharing of program learning. Um, looking at the progress and achievements of the 10 funds reviewed under this evaluation, the funds judged to be the most successful tended also to be those with the most intensive fund management. Um, there's some evidence that donors have over time tended to move towards the right of this uh, continuum, if you like, for, um, towards more intensive fund management. And this has sometimes been to enhance accountability in response to more public scrutiny on use of aid budgets, accountability to beneficiaries. But this can be taken to the extreme and there needs to be a balance between the acceptable level of fiduciary and performance risk for the purposes of accountability and the level and associated costs of fund management resources. The next slide presents uh, the results of a simple analysis of the total costs associated with each of the funds reviewed. Um, so it presents uh, the, the fund management costs for each fund as a percentage of total program funds 
plotted against the assessed progress towards defined outcomes and development impact. So again, we see that the uh, fund management costs for the four best performing funds um, range between 30 and 44% of total program funds, which is probably a little bit on the high side for ranges usually quoted for enterprise challenge funds of 15 to 40%. The fund management costs of the CSCS tends to be less resource tense intensive and less costly than the enterprise challenge funds. Um, there are a couple of outliers here. The Sustainability and Resilience Fund is essentially a, a research fund, and although it's being managed well, the outcomes have been assessed to be at the beginning of a very long pathway to development impact. Um, okay, and uh, just moving on to the final slide. Um, the, these considerations of intensity of fund management um, lead to some broader questions about the, about the intensity of fund manage management and how to uh, establish the right level. And uh, those are, you know, is the provision of very intensive support to gr grantees, innovators, investees replicable at scale? So you may be achieving success with the intensive support provided during the implementation, but is that well at scale? And what's being viable without the same level of support? Um, and just the second, another point is that we're not aware of any systematic uh, cost-benefit analysis of challenge funds, but we believe this would be a very useful exercise to help inform decisions on the appropriate level of program resources to invest in fund management. Um, so, for the Q&A session, you may want to consider the questions on, on this slide. Thank you. Right. Um, we've got a, a couple of questions that have come up. Um, tailored guidance and support during the launch phase appears to be important. To which extent can projects challenge funds support in writing editing proposals? Um, so I think um, from the experience of uh, the funds in this uh, evaluation and our own experience of challenge fund management. Um, part of it is being aware of the types of organizations you are targeting and um, also the, the requirements of the fund in terms of compliance and identifying where there may be the need for additional support. So it may be that there is a, a need for uh, webinars, uh, seminars, or additional guidance related to gender and inclusion or uh, yeah, environmental impact. Or it may be that, um, you know, where the fund is an enterprise fund supporting businesses uh, that may be new to the development aid field, that it's more support in terms of looking at how their interventions may lead to development impact. Um, I think the, the question is also, you know, uh, looking at, you know, is it is it then a, a fair playing field if you are supporting applicants? Um, I think the the general types of support um, and you know those those tricky issues that may be particularly problematic for applicants um, should be made available to all applicants, to be fair, um, particularly at the first stage of two-stage application processes. Um, once uh, you've got through the first stage, and working with a, a smaller number of uh, applicants developing full proposals, there may be more opportunity to work with them on developing the, the quality of the applications, but again, it should be an even playing field that all get access to the same support. And in those cases, it's particularly important 
that there is an independent uh, selection panel involved in the final selection process. Yeah, I, th there is a case, not in, not in the challenge funds that we reviewed, but in Bangladesh um, of an extreme poverty challenge fund called Sheree, where the fund manager did assist the applicants in their proposals. And as Martin said, it's very important that because the fund manager became, if you like, associated with some of the applications, that you needed to hand over the project selection process to an independent investment committee. Um, I think as a, as, a, as a rule of thumb here, um, if the applicant needs help in putting the proposal together, it should ring a little bit of an alarm bell um, in the sense that you're expecting the civil society organization or the business to be able to respond to the challenge. But if, on the other hand, you're simply helping the applicant understand the results measurement process or the reporting to the fund, then that's another matter. Just a comment on that, though. <coughs> I mean, it, uh, it brings us back to the question raised in the previous webinar about the usual suspects. It's certainly true that your usual suspects will know how to apply and they will know application processes like this backwards. But to the extent that you're starting to move into territory with very unknown or small organizations, they may well need help. And just a small anecdote, in the course of our evaluation, we ran two workshops for grantees of different funds, one in Nairobi and one in Dakar. And we asked them the question about the kinds of technical assistance that they received from fund managers and what they valued more and what they valued less. And receiving assistance in the application process scored very highly for something that people rated very highly. And as Martin says, this is, this is support they basically received having got through the first round. So the first round tends to be a very short, uh, perhaps it's a two-page uh, description of what it is they plan to do. But if that, if that is accepted to the next round, then the requirements become much more onerous. And that's the point at which many of these applicants really needed and valued the help that they received from the fund manager. There's just an, an additional point on the, on the selection of the project. I think what we're highlighting in, in, in the report and identified in terms of best practice is actually the whole process of pitching or interviewing the actual business, the applicant at the final stage is very important. Um, often you will have proposals that have been prepared by a consultant or an NGO and not by the organization themselves, and you really need to assess whether that organization is capable of implementing what's been written down on paper. So that whole process of selection is very important to see whether the organization has the capacity to implement, whether it's really genuine in its ability to do what it says has been written down, and to ensure that actually that challenge can be met. Because you're always dealing here with relatively high risk projects and you need to make sure the organization actually has that capacity to deliver what they promised. Okay. Um, so we have a, a, a question. Um, what are the top three or four improvements fund managers could make to support more robust assessment of the results, i.e. assessing the performance of the funds or the poverty reducing impacts from re impacts. Um, okay, I think uh, this goes back to one of the key things is being very clear in the definitions of what outcome and impact actually mean for a particular fund. So very clear definitions of outcomes and impact and supported by indicators that, that help to understand you know, what those outcomes or impacts will look like and what can realistically be measured. And also where a, a program is hoping to achieve systemic changes, again, uh, quite a nebulous term and being very clear on what sort of changes are, are meant there and, and establishing frameworks that enable 
monitoring of progress towards them. Um, it's probably also important to, to see those results um, and, and link them to uh, some sort of a results chain or theory of change to identify you know, progress indicators as well. And um, we would have to say that um, for uh, measuring the, the poverty impact or development impact of particularly for enterprise challenge funds, um, our hosts, the DCED, have excellent guidelines of how to approach that. David, anything to add? Uh, yeah, no, I think as Martin says, it's very important that the understanding of what it is you're going to be measuring needs to be established right from the outset. And uh, therefore, having a theory of change, having a results chain, which tracks the impact pathway, has to be established before funding it starts. And then it's very important that the results chain is a, is a a living document which is amended according to experience and changes that take place during the course of implementation, um, but still shows the, the key link between the activities of the project and the development outcomes that you're trying to achieve and how that's being measured and how that's being validated. So I think as a very broad statement, the results measurement of challenge funds was something that was overlooked at the beginning and the sort of newer generation of funds that we've seen have placed far more attention on to ensuring that results measurement is an important part of that process. Two, <clears throat> two small comments. You know, the, the uh, participant asked if there are the top three or four improvements. Well, there's certainly two that immediately spring to mind. Uh, one of which we touched on earlier, and that's around tracking. So David spoke about, and Martin both spoke about the importance of building that in from the, the beginning. But actually, part of it is also about continuing to track results after the end of the funding period, so that you can take a view over three years or potentially five years, rather than over the 18 months to two years, which is the usual duration of the funding. That's point one. And point two is also where possible to get independent verification results. So in many cases, what we see when funds do report on how sustainable outcomes have been, a lot of it tends to be self-reported by grantees. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, to the extent that it's possible to do this independently, uh, you'd like to get a much, a much more accurate read on, on outcomes and impact. There's, of course, a trade-off. If you have hundreds of grantees, it's extremely difficult to do. But if you have a small number of grantees who are getting quite deep uh, and in-depth support from fund managers that should certainly be a viable, a viable option. Okay, we have uh, another question here. Is it recommended that capacity building, or TA, technical assistance, be provided by the fund manager or through outsourcing? Um, I think uh, there's ex examples of, of learning um, from the implementation of, of some challenge funds we looked at under this evaluation, um, where it switched from the fund manager providing the technical assistance uh, from a central resource um, to an outsourcing to much more localized resources. Um, and the reasons for that is partly because these were global funds working in a number of countries. So providing TA from a central resource, especially where it requires you no know, face-to-face -face engagement is impractical. Um, but also, I think, in terms of uh, sustainability of, of, of support, if there is a local uh, source that can be accessed during the, the funding period, uh, the investee will be able to continue to access that support if necessary beyond the lifetime of the project. Um, there are also so uh, models where the investees or innovators um, have part of their budget um, assigned to them to decide um, on their own technical assistance or capacity building requirements and to use the budget for those purposes. 
Um, so those, I think, are the, the, the key learning points from uh, the evaluation. I mean, David, do you? Well, I, I think the key thing here is that if you're going to have technical assistance to the to the project, to the business, or to the civil society organisation, the grantee has to own that technical assistance. So it is it is important that there is a process whereby the grantee is to some extent managing that activity and ensuring that those results are achieved, rather than being seen as something that is imposed by the fund manager. Um, the fund manager obviously needs to ensure the quality of the technical assistance delivery and, and what that's been used for, but it's important that it's seen to be something that is actually used by the grantee in order to make either the business or the organization more sustainable in the long term. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they have to be in control of it. And I think technical assistance is an interesting topic if we look at the evolution of challenge funds. So technical assistance, I'd say, in the past was, was often an add-on. It was something that was provided because over the course of the fund it became clear that grantees needed a certain amount of help. But as Martin has shown, increasingly there is more intensive involvement and in provision of technical assistance of different types in funds. So, when one thinks about this question of where it comes from, is it you know is, is it in-house with the fund manager or outsource? These are design questions that should be considered up front, mm -hmm. and which will also be guided by the nature of that assistance. So, in some cases, the assistance may be quite general: how to write a good business case, for example, which everybody needs to know; how to budget; how to keep accounts. And perhaps that's something that the fund manager should be providing. But in other cases, the assistance might be highly technical and highly specific, in which case it doesn't make sense for the fund manager to bring that in-house, but that should be outsourced to experts. And um, one of the areas where we see this, for example, is in managing uh, bid processes to commercial investors. In some cases, a, a, a fund manager may do that themselves. In other cases, they might bring in technical assistance from investment bankers and specialists like that to assist investees or grantees when they start to look for next tranches of investment after the fund. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, just uh, one further point on that. I think um, it's also part of, should be part of the context analysis to identify you know, if there are um, providers of relevant technical assistance or capacity building services um, within the, the, the country or the context of the, the, the fund, um, because if, it, you know, if they are there um, and operating well, it's um, better to use those resources rather than to bring in uh, additional. Okay, thank you, um, Martin, Matthew, and David. Um, I see we don't have any further questions just now, but while I perhaps give uh, a few more seconds for anyone who would like to, to send their uh, urgent question, let me just point out also that um, the DCD has a website on private sector engagement, and it was mentioned earlier that there are some guidelines also on results measurement and challenge funds. So if you go to the website uh, under implementing PSD, uh, you can find this web page on private sector engagement, which will uh, yeah, list all these uh, resources for uh, relevant for uh, challenge fund design and, and results measurement. And of course, we encourage everyone to uh, read uh, Triple Line's evaluation. Uh, you will have received the link to the full evaluation as well as a short brief um, with the joining instructions for this webinar. Um, I see there's still no further questions, which means uh, obviously Martin's presentation and, and the comments have answered uh, all of your burning questions, which is great. Um, so I would say thanks a lot to uh, IPA Triple Line um, for, I think, these very insightful uh, lessons on, on the link between fund management intensity and uh, development outcomes. I think uh, very valuable for all of us. Um, do feel free to send us uh, any follow-up questions by email, uh, and also to um, to Sida, who, uh, as I mentioned earlier, welcomes any questions on their challenge funds, and I'm just sharing their email address again in the chat box uh, below. 
um, as well as the link to the feedback form. So if you could just briefly indicate um, how you like this webinar and uh, if you'd like future offers on, on this topic, uh, that would be very helpful. Otherwise, uh, thanks again uh, to the presenters and to all of you who joined and asked questions. Um, and we wish you a very good rest of the evening or day. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the CED for the uh, excellent facilitation yeah, thank you and uh, to CEDA for uh, enabling this evaluation to take place. Yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you. Bye.